ऋतम वदिष्या सत्यम वदिष्या तन्मावत तद्वक्तावत अवत माम अवत वक्तारम अवत may my speech be established in my mind may the mind to be firmly established in my speech may there be perfect correspondence between my thoughts words and actions may the truths given out by the great sages and recorded in scriptures come to me may those teachings be luminous in my life may my true divine being manifest in my day to day life may not what i learn from the scriptures ever forsake me let me live my life day and night according to their teachings i shall speak what is appropriate i shall speak the truth may that protect me may that protect the teacher om peace 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 let us meditate on that which is unchanging separating it from all that is evanescent ephemeral temporary all the forms and the names they come and go they are in constant flux they are not real this substance that which does not change is real
let us make a conscious effort to transcend our body and mind which are changing all the time in fact the illusion of time comes from these changes just let us take this cloth of body off from us just as one can take the clothing off the body is also a clothing i am feeling that i am taking the body off it is not i freed from it i see the truth that i am not born just as putting a new garment doesn't mean i am born so also taking up another body is not my birth i am not the body i have no birth no growth no death i have no age or gender all these burden some bondages go away when we see i am not body so also i am not the mind it is an inner body that also i take off i have no elation or depression
I have no worries, no fears. beyond time and space I am perfection itself I have no desires. So no sufferings. It is all bliss. It is all peace. Om Peace Peace Dear friends, let us chant the three salutations of Buddhists because 
this year we are studying uh, a very special Buddhist text, Mahayana text. And these are uh, common to all Buddhists to recite this at the beginning of their uh, daily studies. Buddham Saranam Gachami Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Sangam Saranam Gachami What it means in English language is I take refuge in the awakened one, the Buddha. I take refuge in his teachings and I take refuge in all those uh, who are practicing these teachings. A community uh, that is called Sangha, a community is the group of practitioners. One has to uh, take uh, refuge in that community as well because through that community uh, we get connected to those teachings in our life. These are not merely the books but it is a wisdom to be imbibed and therefore uh, connection with the community is important. So that is called Sangha. Uh, Sangha is the uh, organization so where we all are connected and uh, through that connection the learning gets shared. Uh, it is like all our electric, you know, the, it is connected with some central grid. So through that we all derive power and then many of us like this building has a solar panels on it. So they generate power and that power is fed into the grid and so that also gets distributed. So uh, it loses its sense of mine and yours once it goes to the grid. Am I getting the solar power that I am generating? Uh, don't ask this question. It is. Mm. So, when uh, you uh, have a, say, a glass of water and you pour it in the ocean, now which is the water that I poured, can you tell? Uh, it, it is impossible to think of these things. That is all gone. So, uh, Sangha is in a way like that and it is a way therefore to lose uh, one's egos. So, we are all part of this Sangha. In all religious traditions you will see this importance to these uh, three ideas of taking refuge. I take refuge in the enlightened one. I mean there are so many enlightened ones but a special one through whose great life the teaching uh, has been scattered with tremendous power all over the world. So that is the uh, what is called the original Buddha so I take refuge in that, but taking refuge in a person is not what is intended. 
Now what is intended is to see uh, the teachings that are manifested in that life. So I take refuge in the teachings. Otherwise just we uh, revere some image, uh, some person, but do not learn from that person. So taking refuge in the teachings. Uttam saranam gachami dhammam, that is dharma. Dhammam saranam gachami, the teachings, the body of teachings. And one should remember that these teachings are not uh, merely the words. The words are carriers. Mm, through the words we extract the teachings. It is the awareness, the, uh, especially it is so important in Buddhism. Mm, it is uh, the, because it is, uh, the Buddha is not a person as such. It is awakened one, the one who wakes up. Uh, that is, and wakes up to what? Now you may say, well, we all wake up, you know, what do you mean that we go to bed at night and then in the morning uh, we wake up uh, and then we uh, just, uh, you know, are uh, the, when we just wake up, it is uh, a hazy awareness of uh, what is going on, the surrounding. I tell sometimes a joke uh, that it is a person was... Uh, mm, uh, showing that uh, his, his friend who saw that uh, this man's ear uh, is kind of burnt black. Uh, what happened? You know, early morning I was still not awake and then uh, the phone rang and I just stretched my hand to pick it up but actually uh, I made a mistake, there was a hot iron uh, that I put to my ear instead of phone. That is what happened, you know. So the ear got burned there. The friend says, but what about the other ear? That also got burnt. You know that stupid fellow called again. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it is. Mm. So the uh, you wake up, but things are still not in proper place. Mm, it is, uh, uh, you are hazy. One of our devotees, that happened many years ago, uh, she used to come very often, uh, almost uh, uh, every day. So, uh, one morning, uh, we were sitting at breakfast, and then, uh, I was asking her a few things and she was uh, not answering properly, was getting irritated and this. So after some time then uh, she gave proper answers. said, what happened? Mm, Swami, at that time I didn't have my coffee, you know. So I was not fully awake. So it is coffee. I have a nice cup. It says, uh, that imitating that song, very famous song, Morning is broken. Mm. The, it's, the first line is that, the morning is broken. <coughs> the second line is different. It is not in the, the song. Coffee can fix it. <laughs> the morning <laughs> right now is broken. Uh, but if uh, it needs to be fixed, there is this coffee that will fix it. So that is getting awakened. And then you see what is around you. The confusion goes away. You know where you are, uh, with whom are you talking, uh, what is the topic that is being spoken about, and you become clear what uh, you need to do. Uh, you immediately remember that, well, yes, uh, I have to go to Boston to teach, isn't it, Yona? Sometimes, yeah. So I have to rush. Oh, it is already time for the train. I have to uh, rush. So you become aware of all that uh, when that awakening happens. Till that, till then, it is kind of hazy picture 
who is what uh, half dreamy and like that so uh, our state in this world is like that we are uh, confused although we are woken up from one kind of you know sleep and dream this also is not a state of complete deliverance from confusion we have uh, many unanswered questions in life and there are so many contradictions that we are caught up in uh, like the most common is that we do things to become happy it is uh, for that all our actions are guided that if i do this i will become happy but then we end up in getting misery in the name of happiness a common experience you know that is why this search for happiness continues uh, till uh, the last breath why does it happen like that if i am going to get happiness then i should get happiness uh, if say for example uh, i have to pick up this i go and pick it up mm, that's it you know so uh, there is no confusion about it but i go to get happiness and it seems to elude me where did it go i just saw it there i saw that in this person this man or this woman uh, there is happiness and i did uh, come in contact with that man or that woman but the happiness uh, was gone where did it go a mm, uh, very puzzling questions then who am i that is a very important question that keeps on bothering a person uh, at least it should bother that who am i i use the word every now and then uh, we are very happy to talk about ourselves you know it is never tired of it that it is the listeners get tired oh enough you know but you no know, my enthusiasm about talking about myself doesn't wane uh, we are all i specialist in that sense so it is i uh, but where is this that we don't know confusion you know what is it so we are not really awakened to the truth this awakening to the truth is therefore the state of fully awakened established in the state of total freedom bliss enlightenment so that is how a uh, buddha uh, reached that state that is how he became a buddha he was born a siddhartha i here want to allude one very nice lecture on buddha that was given uh, at this vedanta society many years ago uh, about uh, i think um, 17 years ago i think yeah so on the birth anniversary of buddha uh, in indian tradition it is uh, the full moon day of uh, around the month of may mm, so in the month of may usually it falls the full moon day of that uh, it is one full moon day is the buddha's birthday it is called therefore uh, buddha purnima so uh, on that day i had uh, requested him to come and speak he was a buddhist monk at this providence zen center uh, many of you know uh, this place you know in cumberland very beautiful place so uh, he was a monk there then and on uh, this occasion uh, i had invited him to speak and then 
I asked him to advertise, you know, what should be the title of your talk. He said, Buddha's birthday. I said, well, that is the, you are, the date you are speaking, but what's the title? Uh, well, that's the title. And then I was waiting, what is he going to speak? Mm. And he told that when somebody gets enlightened, a Buddha is born, you know. Uh, that is the Buddha's birthday. Uh, that is such a very beautiful way of putting it. What is the day of birthday of Buddha? You know, Buddha himself said uh, that I was born as uh, Siddhartha. Uh, my name was not Buddha then. But I did something. And thus I got enlightened. I uh, understood what is right, what is not right. I gave up that which is not right and I held on to that which is right. Uh, in short, that is what uh, I did and so I became Buddha. Whosoever does that is a Buddha. Buddha is not name of a person but it is the state of becoming free from all confusion, uh, living in contradictions and always having the cravings for different things. Mm, that is uh, the result of ignorance. The state of Buddha is uh, becoming free from all this. So whosoever attains to that state is Buddha. Mm. So, uh, and when somebody attains that, to that state, a Buddha is born. Do you get it? Mm. Buddha is born like that. Each of us, therefore, uh, can become Buddha uh, by doing this simple thing. Uh, there are ways of things doing in a simple way, uh, easy. When you know, you do it correctly. If you do not know, you keep on struggling and even after putting in lot of efforts, uh, things all get really complicated. Instead of making them simplified, uh, you make it more and more complicated. And I know one gentleman, you know, he had the penchant, means the desire, you know, to uh, repair some uh, things, whatever, you know, uh, simple machines and all that, uh, like a vacuum cleaner or, okay, uh, uh, I, uh, he would open it. Uh, a lot of enthusiasm was there, but no knowledge. So, uh, it would be, uh, to begin with, it is not working. Uh, and then when he ended that, oh my goodness, uh, it was impossible to fix it for anybody else. Uh, nobody knew now where what was. <laughs> So, mm, all would get so complicated. So, our knowledge is like that, to get things more complicated. So, Buddha, everything now has been harmonized, falls in place. There is no confusion. And the result is peace. Mm. When we are confused, we don't know, lot of agitation and no peace. Mm. When, uh, like uh, the jigsaw puzzle, uh, things are in place, ah, now there is peace. So, the whole universe now becomes uh, completely harmonious. Everything uh, has fallen in place. All the confusion has gone away. Supreme peace. So nothing more is wanted. 
that is the state that one comes to and all uh, religions guide us to that in that in their essential uh, um, teachings every religion in the essay, in its essential teachings uh, tells us that this is the goal this enlightenment and follow this path and you will get there and sri ramakrishna practiced many different religions of this world and then came by all these different paths ultimately to the same goal same that state so it is wonderful to see how he uh, went through different paths arriving at that one common goal of all religions and like uh, you can come to this place by various paths mm. depending on where you are somebody who is to, uh, staying towards the west will have to come to east and somebody mm, he is already to much towards the east will have to come to the west their paths will be seemingly opposite Uh, so the religions of the world uh, in their external form seem to be uh, different and sometimes opposite to each other but then they come to the same one ultimate realization so uh, this is what is called the mystic aspect of religion uh, this mysticism is the heart of all religions Uh, the other things of religion uh, like you know there are certain forms that okay you have to go to such a place a religious place at this time uh, you have to uh, wave the lamp three times or four times you have to fast on certain days uh, they are all external aspects Uh, they are taught for two people to be in that context to be able to understand and practice the truth but uh, they are not universal it is uh, just to give an example i was having uh, a discussion with a muslim chaplain in a university and uh, that was uh, the month of ramadan so uh, of course it was not uh, that long summer days so it was not that difficult then so uh, the days were shorter so okay then uh, about 7 8 hours 9 hours of fasting then you can eat uh, i said to him well you know it keeps on changing according to the lunar uh, these uh, Uh, the ramadan month fasting month keeps on changing now imagine you are in alaska and it uh, it falls uh, that ramadan month falls in uh, say july or june uh, you when will you take food this sun as it were never sets so uh, uh, what do you do he said yes this is a problem so we have therefore decided although there is no unanimity about it but we have decided to follow the mecca time ah. so uh, there it is near the equator so uh, the whatever may be the season winter or summer uh, the day and night duration doesn't vary much so uh, that is what we have decided to follow the fasting is important as a spiritual discipline but that is not the goal there are some sects in india uh, who fast a lot i mean uh, so much of fasting 
the the body gets emaciated get many diseases uh, but they still because that is according to the religion uh, it is one form of practice one should see that does it take me to the goal and that goal is realizing uh, the ultimate truth so uh, when one practices religion with that goal then uh, it becomes the mystical aspect of the religion uh, such a person who has seen this ultimate truth and is experiencing it in life that person is therefore called a mystic <coughs> we have been uh, learning this mysticism uh, aspects every summer uh, this we started from 2008 so this is how much 13th year that we are doing it and we have taken up the mystics of various different religions uh, many sufi mystics uh, the jewish kabbalah mystics uh, we have also studied like kashmir shaivism uh, we have studied daoism many different books different years we have studied uh, christian mystics like the cloud of unknowing meister eckhart and so forth so it is a wonderful study to say how uh, all of them they teach the same thing in different languages different emphasis uh, emphasis and so forth so uh, that is a very joyous uh, exploration uh, for us to see uh, that yes all of them are true and when we study swami vivekananda emphasizes this that uh, when you study the mystic disciplines of different religions uh, what benefit you get is that uh, whatever religion you are following you see in that religion that you are following what is the essential aspect and what is the non essential aspect because the essential aspect is the same in all the non essential aspects differ so by studying these mystic disciplines in all religions we get to this truth that this is uh, the true religion otherwise the hindus and uh, they would think that touching this is uh, non religious uh, touching this is okay now is it really religion mm, it is uh, just something that passes for religion uh, wearing certain kind of clothing uh, is that religion uh, so we tend to hold on to these forms as religion so when we see that well other religion is not holding the same form see how this happens you know i see that say uh, a hindu person uh, i used to have this problem you know that certain forms and we adhere to think that that is religion uh, i had a, some time a query uh, somebody had on email asked a question that how can one uh, follow the religion the religion will all be destroyed from society if certain uh, these rituals are not followed uh, and this uh, this society he was from india this american society doesn't seem to follow it uh, so it will all the religion will be gone here how should we practice religion Mm, i replied to him that these things change uh, even in india 200 years ago many of these things were practiced differently mm, it is uh, uh, his question was unless we put uh, that forehead mark that women put a, a forehead mark in 
India. If they don't put it, uh, how could the religion will survive, you see? Uh, as if uh, that was uh, the, the uh, all sum and substance of religion. Uh, we stick to such forms and, you see, hold on to the shell and miss the kernel. So, therefore, it is important to, you know, look at uh, other religions. Well, uh, they are not uh, having uh, uh, this, these particular forms and yet a person can uh, realize the ultimate truth by that path. So, I understand then that putting a vermilion mark on the head uh, doesn't mean uh, religion. <laughs> Whether you put a vermilion mark or you do not put it, the point is, are you moving towards the goal, mm, that ultimate goal of life where uh, all confusion is gone, uh, you come to that state of enlightenment. So, uh, friends, that is how we get benefited by the study of mysticism. Uh, mysticism is the heart of all religions. Others are, you know, the changing paraphernalia uh, and they become the point of dispute and quarrels. It is, the religions do not have conflict. The externals have conflict. That, oh, the Muslims do it this way. Ah, the Christians do it in another way. There also the Protestants do it in this way. Uh, the um, Catholics have completely different uh, way of doing it. Well, uh, okay, then come on, fight. And it goes to violence automatically, you know. When there is the conflict in the mind, uh, it appears uh, in argumentation, uh, quarrels, and then uh, soon these words are out at each other's throats. So, uh, that is a very common scenario in uh, the, the uh, different religious practice practices. Uh, the, my religion, your religion, whose religion is true. So let us uh, take out our swords and fight. Let us see who wins the fight. So that is not the way to decide the truth of a religion. Practice. Uh, have that goal. And then move towards that goal. Uh, it is, uh, as you move, you will see that uh, uh, you are becoming more and more illumined. Uh, as a result, you can see the God in everything. You can feel that the God is guiding everybody. It is uh, uh, not uh, you who can dictate somebody else. So, uh, this is how the mysticism helps uh, study, mystic study of different religions help us. Uh, a very common uh, this thing, example given by Swami Vivekananda, it was given before Swami Vivekananda also. Uh, it is uh, uh, like there is a saying of, it is attributed to Voltaire. So, uh, the very beautiful imagery. Uh, you can think of, you know, yourself as uh, a point on the circumference of this circle. Mm. Now, how many points are there on the circumference of a circle? Huh? What do you think, Adi? How many will be the number of points on the circumference of a circle? Huh? Hard to say. Hard to say. <laughs> uh, it is because it is not finite. That is why it is called infinite. Uh, it is hard to say uh, because uh, if you say 500 in amongst the, those 500 points, again there will be each 500 points. So it is hard to say, therefore it is called infinite. Mm. And how many centers are there for a circle? 
just one. Mm, just one. That is the goal of each individual. Each of us is like a point on the circumference of a circle and we are, we are moving. That center is the concentration of uh, existence, knowledge and bliss. That can be uh, told as the goal of us. We all are wanting these uh, uh, three things that we want. Uh, the knowledge, we want the bliss, we want the real true existence that doesn't go away. That is this point. Uh, the Vedanta calls it Sat Chidananda. Uh, it is existence, knowledge and bliss. So this is where we are traveling. If you see the efforts of everybody, uh, the, the, you see these three aspects to it that I want to exist and I don't want an ignorant existence I want uh, to know uh, what is going on who am I what are the things around and so forth and then I also want how can I make my life happier and happier so uh, that is the direction that we are taking uh, but if we miss the wrong direction, then we won't get to the goal. So, uh, from each point on the circumference, there is uh, the radius that connects to the center. Mm. So, that will be my shortest path to the goal. Mm. But our while Luko's shortest path, because he is at a different point on the circumference, will be naturally very different, you see. Uh, Hannah will be going uh, towards that circle on a different path, because she is at a different point on the circumference. Mm. So what happens? Our paths are different. Uh, two points at the end of the uh, diameter of the circle. Uh, now, they will be traveling in the opposite direction. Are they really opposed to each other? Uh, apparently, yes, but actually they are also going to the same point. In goal, they all unite. So, uh, and although they are, you know, apparently very different. You can see that as they come towards the center, and this is a point to be marked, that the distance between them starts reducing. Mm. So we can understand the different religions uh, better, more sympathetically. We come closer to them. So this is another benefit of seeing the point of view of others. This also is an expression of a loving connectedness with others. That yes, the same God is guiding everybody. So, knowing this, we start feeling love to all. Love depends on something that is a common aspect. Mm, love rests on a commonality. So, it is uh, what is common? God is our common reality. Mm, that is, uh, the, thus, based on that, the true love can arise in us. So, this is uh, the purpose of studying the mystic disciplines of all different religions. And this year, we have chosen a very celebrated text of Mahayana Buddhism. I am taking this particular translation uh, that it is Guide to Bodhisattva's Way of Life. Uh, this uh, translation is uh, done by, you know, originally translated and revised from Sanskrit into Tibetan by several translators 
including uh, Dharma Shri Bhadra Rinchen Sangupyo Shakyamati and Sumakti Kriti and uh, Lodian Sherab. So, this present translation from Tibetan into English was rendered by Jan La Kestlang uh, under the compassionate guidance of Venerable Geshe Kelsang Jiatso Rinpoche, a very well-known teacher. So, uh, this text uh, is uh, at this author is Shanti Deva. Uh, it was composed originally in Sanskrit, and there is uh, about Shanti Deva, the author. Uh, very little biographical information is available. Uh, whatever little is available is also in the form of legends, not really how historical it is. Uh, we, we have no way to, but this book is there. So there is somebody who is author of this book. <laughs> so such a person did exist. Uh, this this original name of this book is Bodhi Charya Avatara or Bodhi Sattva Charya uh, Sattva Charya Avatara. Bodhi Bodhi Charya Avatara or Bodhi Sattva Charya Avatara. So uh, that is. Uh, the legend goes like this that uh, this Shanti Deva was uh, uh, son of a king in uh, Saurashtra region towards uh, you know the, the uh, upper west coast in India. So uh, that is a place, lot of uh, not exactly his birthplace, but that Saurashtra has many. Uh, places of pilgrimage uh, in India, many go there, uh, like the very famous Somnath temple. So, uh, he was uh, son of a king there and was heir to the throne. But uh, he, in a dream, saw that one deity, uh, this, that is how a Buddhist scholar uh, and who has mentioned this Shanti Deva uh, in his writings? His name was Taranath. So Taranath, uh, is an ancient Buddhist writer himself. So uh, he said that one day uh, he got the vision of uh, Tara, goddess Tara. That goddess Tara means it is you know the one the form uh, of this divine who makes you cross over uh, this uh, say ocean of uh, misery or ocean of confusion uh, so that is Tara so he saw that it is told to him that uh, no do not just uh, uh, go to be and to be remembered by all suffering. So go uh, to learn at Nalanda, the way of the Buddha. The Nalanda University was very famous then. It is uh, uh, what is called in that, uh, that area. Nalanda is a part in uh, modern Bihar. It became, you know, full of Buddhist uh, uh, followers. And that is how the name Bihar also came up. Bihar means actually Bihar uh, is it could be the proper Sanskrit way of uh, writing it or the Sanskrit way. It means the place where monks live. So uh, that is the Bihar. It became Bihar. So uh, Nalanda was the university there and he went there. Uh, it is from Saurashtra to there, I don't know exactly, but maybe about a thousand miles journey. So he went there and 
uh, while staying there they there were lot of students monks uh, who were also studying there uh, and there was a their the abbot of that monastery so uh, this shanti deva was seen to be a very lazy lethargic fellow uh it is uh, uh, we wouldn't be doing anything nobody saw him studying uh, all that he would do as it is described by one uh, uh, this uh, uh, nun there one uh, monastic nun there uh, in the buddhist tradition then so she said that all this fellow does is uh, eats sleeps and poops nothing more than that so it is uh, and so they were you know the uh, the pontiff uh, first said okay you know he will gradually go we'll see later uh, but as the things went on they saw that he is not changing his way of living and the others are getting affected laziness you know is also infectious uh, very uh, like corona or worse you know it is uh, that somebody is lazy uh, you also start feeling lazy oh i am not uh, if you, it it has happened so many times uh, if uh, um, my uh, teacher would tell me hey Uh, come on you do this study why are you not doing this studies properly eh you are wasting your time instead of correcting myself i will tell uh, this fellow also is doing like this that person is also doing like why are you singling me out that is not justice so therefore the pontiff and the others they thought that this fellow should be shaken up uh we don't want to kick out anybody but then we, this fellow may we will make some arrangement so that he will leave himself mm. so uh they told him that oh, you have to teach one day why don't you teach and they th- thought that he will immediately say no no i will not do so uh, i don't know He said, "Okay." They were surprised. Then they arranged a very uh, big, you know, throne. Uh, for, uh, the invitations were sent to all that he is going to teach. Come on, because seeing this big gathering and a high pedestal to sit on, uh, this fellow will take fright and run away. Uh, but nothing like that he that uh, shanti deva uh, climbed the uh, on that high pedestal the throne and started teaching that is this book bodhi charya avatara that uh, it was uh, original sanskrit and the verse form these verses just sprang from his mouth and everybody was so surprised that so much learning is there and not only that so called scholarly learning not bookish learning at all uh, as he came uh, to the ninth chapter uh, there is the statement thus the subject and object they become united and there is now nothing left for the thought to go to so thought disappears and they saw this shanti deva levitating and becoming you know uh, just gone in the air and they were hearing the voice from the air uh that uh, uh, the ninth chapter and 10th chapter uh, was delivered like that 
and he told that another in my room you will find another book the remainder of my teachings uh, that was uh, the shiksha samuchchay this is bodhi charya avatara uh, that book uh, in english translation that is available uh, it is called and uh, the anthology of shanti deva so it is a bigger collection so i was originally thinking of taking that up for this class uh, but it is rather too big and a bit difficult so uh, therefore for because we have only seven classes to for this study so therefore i took up this one and uh, uh, for seven tuesdays to come we plan to continue with this study and uh, today uh we will uh, take up this book you know is available on amazon.com uh, and i just have two copies out there if anybody wants to buy you can buy there uh, two copies i have kept it is 17 dollars each so uh, you can uh, we will begin today uh first couple of verses mm. uh, first let us see what is the meaning of this word bodhi or buddha mm. it comes from the sanskrit root buddh means to know uh, to be conscious of uh, to be aware of all these different connotations they are associated with this sanskrit root buddh so uh that means to know and thus they one who has known everything to be known is called buddha uh it also means to be as we saw be conscious of the truth uh not conscious just of the appearances mm, it is uh, an analogy that i give many times because it is very illustrative is that of animal crackers mm, animal crackers mm, so uh, there is a giraffe uh, and there is a crocodile uh, there is a lion a deer are they different uh, in appearance they are different for babies they are different mm. uh, when the baby say graduates Uh, from kindergarten and goes to say first grade now the distinctions have vanished knows that all of them uh, are, are same so uh, our uh, bodh or our awareness is uh, like that of babies we see only the differences uh, i am different from these other people i am different from the chair that i am sitting on mm it is and then the good and bad the likes and dislikes they get associated tormenting us all the time so that is how patanjali describes it very beautifully that is how we suffer in this world so uh, that is the uh, not true awareness it is just like a baby seeing the animal crackers and then is desirous of eating say a giraffe and if somebody gives a deer the baby will not like it uh, what is this i don't want to eat a deer i wanted to eat giraffe so because for baby these distinctions are there so for we spiritual babies these distinctions they become our life we whole life gets based on only these distinctions that i am different from them and i am good isn't it i am always good the others are bad so you know, that is why we come in conflict with others attractions and repulsions so uh, this is not the the true awareness so that is uh, the the buddha state and those who are desirous of getting to it they are this awareness 
they are called bodhisattvas. Means their awareness has this goal now. Uh, uh, they are marching towards that goal. It is, uh, they have not realized it, they have not, may not have reached there. But now they are on the path and so they will reach. Mm, so, uh, like uh, uh, somebody, this lady is uh, to leave from here to Florida uh, on day after tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah. So, now, uh, after she leaves from here, if somebody asks where is uh, she, said, well, she has gone to Florida. She might not have reached to Flo uh, Florida. She might be in the flight. But still, since she is on the path, she is on the right track, and we take it for granted that she will be in Florida soon. If, uh, yeah, so if somebody is on the path, on the right track, mm, then mm, that person is sure to arrive there. That is the meaning of a bodhisattva. And then there is another word that comes here very often, bodhicitta. Mm. That what is a bodhicitta means uh, the mind or the, you know, intellect that is established with this, in this conviction that this is what I have to do in life. This is the goal of my life. I want to achieve this. Uh, that is the meaning of goal of life, friends, that you direct all your energies, all your resources in that direction. That is the meaning of goal of life. So, that is called bodhicitta. And there are then the grades, how much, how strong is the conviction. Initially, it may be very feeble conviction, uh, like the conviction that many get when they are reading or studying this thing or li listening to uh, a very inspiring teacher, then while listening they get it. Uh, as soon as they step out of the hall, uh, then uh, that is gone, uh, let us go to Starbucks, that becomes the prominent thought there. Uh, so uh, that is the difference, you know. The conviction came but it went away, didn't stay. So, gradually working on it, it becomes uh, stable. It becomes stronger. It becomes the guiding principle for everything in life. So, that is the development uh, of a bodhicitta. Uh, that is, chitta means mind. Uh, so, the mind is getting now convinced more and more that this is what I want to achieve in my life. So, uh, the first verse we will just read and next Tuesday we will try to uh, ex more explore because the clock is telling me that uh, the, you have, the time is over. So, uh, he begins, I prostrate. We will not refer to Sanskrit, uh, but I read Sanskrit uh, before coming to the class, so uh, to have that understanding behind. So, I prostrate to the enlightened Buddhas endowed with the truth body and to the bodhisattvas and all other objects of prostration. I will explain briefly in accordance with the scriptures how to engage in the condensed practices of bodhisattva. And this is a practice uh, to be carried out. Buddha was immensely practical person. Uh, there was no uh, just uh, time uh, for him to do so-called academic studies. Mm. So, it is uh, with this, uh, to simplify everything, he is doing this and we will uh, 
by the grace of God, continue with the study for another six Tuesdays until we come to the almost the end of this summer time. So, thank you very much. Uh, we will again recite these mantras to conclude. Buddham Sharanam Gachami Buddham Sharanam Gachami Dhammam Sharanam Gachami Dhammam Sharanam Gachami Sangham Sharanam Gachami Sangham Sharanam Gachami Om Shanti 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 Om Shanti 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 Today there was nothing much discussed about the book, so there will be no question and answer session. But from next Tuesday, and we will have a question answer session. Uh, if somebody has asked questions on the web, uh, tell them to hold these questions till uh, coming Tuesday. They can repeat these questions uh, next Tuesday. Maybe next Tuesday in the text itself the answers will come up. Why do you say avatar? Buddhists don't believe in avatars. <laughs> Maybe next Tuesday. <laughs>